In 1913, women flooded down Pennsylvania Avenue toward the White House, walking sturdily and steadily, demanding the right to vote. There were nine bands, five mounted brigades, there were 26 floats, and 8,000 women marching. Helen Keller marched that day. Alice Paul, the lead organizer, said we were silently, peacefully attempting to gain the freedom of 20 million women. We are guilty of no crime. We demand our freedom and we shall continue to ask for it until the government acts. Women came from Europe, Canada, India, Australia, and New Zealand to support a woman's right to vote in these United States. White women from the South threatened to boycott when they heard that black women would be marching too. The fight for freedom and equality, even among women, was divisive. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, you heard their voices earlier, would not give their support to the 15th Amendment, giving black men the vote in 1870. Ms. Anthony is the one who said, I will cut off this right arm of mine before I will ask for the ballot for the Negro and not for the woman. Their partner, Lucy Stone, called them racists. And the movement split for the first, but not the last time. Ida B. Wells, a journalist from Illinois, came with a black delegation to mark, march for freedom and equal rights. When the organizers asked her to march at the end of the lineup, she refused and slipped in between two white women to march for freedom as part of the predominantly white but newly and temporarily integrated Illinois delegation. Delegations from the National Association of Colored Women and from Howard University also marched that day. I like to imagine that they were inspired by one of the first women, an incredible woman, who spoke out against slavery and always for the rights of women, both together, Sojourner Truth, who is the one who said, I feel that I have the right to have just as much as a man. There's a great stir about colored men getting their rights, but not a word about the colored woman. And if colored men get their rights and colored women not theirs, the colored men will be masters over the women and it will be just as bad as it was before. Jeanette Rankin, the first woman ever elected to serve Congress, was there from Montana marching for freedom and equality. She moved to Washington, D.C. four years later in 1917 to begin her first term in Congress before women got the vote. Many men standing and watching along the sidewalks and sidelines jeered at the women shouting, go home to your mothers. To which more than one woman shouted back, my mother's right here. <laughs> the male crowds got rowdy. The violence made the papers. Alice Paul used it to their advantage, saying the government was so broken down it couldn't even protect its women. A month later, a crowd gathered at the Capitol. A congressman had finally introduced a bill declaring that the right of citizens to vote shall not be denied on account of their gender or sex back then. Alice Paul said, women need a cause. Any other life would be empty. And she named it the Susan B. Amendment. By 1913, the day of that great march for freedom and equality, Susan B. Anthony had been dead seven years. I love being a woman. And I often say I wouldn't have been born a woman in any other country, in any other time in history. And I mean it when I say it. I cringe to imagine being denied the right to vote just because I'm a woman. I cringe to imagine being denied the right to own property or to take care of my own children or to control my own body just because I'm a woman. I cringe to imagine being denied the right to vote just because of the color of my skin. 
where would I be without these women prophets? What kind of life would I or any woman living today be living if not for their courage and their commitment? Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great Jewish scholar and theologian, says a prophet is a person who feels fiercely. Prophecy is the voice that God has lent to the silent agony, a voice to the plundered poor and to the profaned riches of this world. It is a form of living, a crossing point of God and man. God is raging in the prophet's words. Actually, Heschel said, prophet, a prophet is a man who feels fiercely. But we're here to set the record straight today. We're here to remember and honor a lineage of women prophets who raised their voices in rage. Women who knew that justice must be demanded and freedom is never free. It's been said that those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And so on this July 4th weekend, we are remembering together. We are remembering. We are putting back together just a few pieces of our nation's more than 100 year long struggle from the end of the Civil War in 1865 to 1965 when the Voting Rights Act finally passed because that's how long it took 100 years of constant and consistent protest to protect all people's right to simply vote. And we are remembering today because it's still true that justice must be demanded. Freedom is never free. And who votes continues to be a contentious issue, even in 2015. You may have read some articles, like the one I read recently. It's entitled, Voter Suppression. How bad? Very bad. In case you haven't read it or one like it, I'm going to read just a bit from it. For the first time, it is a woman writer, by the way. <laughs> For the first time in decades, voters in nearly half the country will find it harder to cast a ballot. These changes are the product of a concerted push to restrict voting since 2010. Strict voter ID laws have gotten most of the attention, but are only part of the story. Cutbacks to early voting and voter registration opportunities and other changes to voting rules have the potential to do just as much damage. We haven't seen anything like this since Reconstruction. The current assault on voting is highly unusual. The last large-scale push was after Reconstruction, and race, again, has been a significant factor. In 2008, understandably so, with Obama running for the presidency, voter participation among African Americans surged. And then came the backlash. The more a state saw increases in minority and low-income voter turnout, the more likely it was to push laws cutting back on voting rights. At the age of 239, our nation is still struggling with its identity, still wrestling with the power, potential, and promises of this democracy. Promises we all know by heart, that all people are created equal, that we are all endowed by our creator with inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But lasting change, I'm learning slowly, <laughs> happens slowly. That's a fact we love and hate at the same time. Whether we hate or love change all depends on what's changing. Depends on who initiated the change, us or the other guy. It depends on what change we feel ready for or not. It's true politically, it's true personally too. It depends on what we're willing to sacrifice for the change that's coming. 
Lasting change happens slowly because it has to go deep. First, our minds must be persuaded. That's when laws change. Then our hearts must be broken open. And that's when our lives change. New laws don't always equal new lives. And many people today, and not just the young people of all ages, seem to think voting is a burden or a distraction or a waste of time. And I'll confess, I can't say I voted in every election I could have since I turned 18. But complacency is one thing some of us will have to sacrifice if we want to create the world we dream about and talk about here in this congregation. So I've heard some say, well, the system's working for me just fine the way it is, so I don't need to vote. And I've heard others say, well, the system will never work for me, so there's no reason to vote. But there is a reason. In fact, there are lots of reasons. I hope you'll leave here today with several of those reasons in your minds and in your hearts, because freedoms won are also freedoms that can be lost. And here's just an example, one example that's current in our news today. It was 52 years ago, which is my lifetime, that South Carolina started flying the Confederate flag again in public spaces. After the Civil War, they wouldn't have done so because it would have been considered treason to do so. They started flying it again for a reason. They started flying it again in response to really in resistance to the civil rights movement of the 1960s. They didn't like the expanding freedoms. They started flying it again because the Confederate flag is an ultimate symbol of white supremacy. And because we are still struggling with our identity as a nation, and we are still wrestling with the power, potential, and promises of this democracy. And because we are still a nation divided, a nation reactive to race, confused by class, we are still a people not yet sure if all men and all women were really and truly created to be treated as equals. I hope you'll go and listen to Marvin Lee Sama, even though I know it makes a long day at All Souls. He will be speaking at our Humanist Hour at 11.30 in Emerson Hall, because he'll be speaking about how the American dream is what we make it. An immigrant from Central, American, Central America, Marvin is a classic American dream success story himself. And he knows intimately the feelings of power and powerlessness that comes with living in a country that is still defining itself and the meaning, the full meaning of its democracy. He knows what our women prophets are asking us to remember today, that justice must be demanded and freedom is never free. The march in 1913 was a great day for women in this country, but it wasn't enough to get the vote. Leaders, women leaders, disagreed from the beginning, and they disagreed then with each other about what strategy to use. Some thought passing legislation state by state was the way forward. They were the more conservative faction. Others believed national legislation was necessary. And so Alice Paul, a radical rebel if ever there was one, started a picket line in front of the White House. I think it was the first ever picket in front of the White House. Six days a week, they stood, silent, facing forward. Month after month, they stood, six days a week. Wealthy women, working class women, white women, black women, young women, old women, mothers, grandmothers, great grandmothers. By then, they had figured out that they needed to stand together. Day after day, they returned, holding signs that read, how long must women wait for liberty? Knowing they would be attacked, and they were. Knowing they would not be protected by police or the government, and they weren't. President Wilson got so frustrated with them, he ordered their arrest on the charge of obstructing traffic. 
The women were badly treated in jail, and the press covered their arrests and their treatment. When they arrested Alice, she went on a hunger strike. Other women followed her lead. Instead of breaking their spirits, their experiences of direct injustice on their own bodies radicalized them. Finally, with 30 women lying on the floor in jail, all with high fevers, all refusing to eat, the president's hand was forced. And the 19th Amendment to the Constitution, protecting a woman's right to vote, came before Congress for a vote. The year was 1920. Men, allies, came from all corners of the country and in all conditions to vote. One came with a broken shoulder and arm. Another one was carried in on a stretcher. One had to leave the deathbed of his wife, came to vote, left to go to her funeral. She had been an ardent suffragist. He was honoring her. When the amendment passed, the women in the gallery watching all started to sing, praise God from whom all blessings flow. But two-thirds of the states needed to ratify the amendment for it to become law. And the southern states were still dead set against black women getting the vote. Losing Delaware forced them to turn south to Tennessee. The house was split when it came time for the vote. And then Harry Byrne, 24 years old, the youngest member of the House and a Republican, voted yes. It took a few minutes for everyone to realize what had happened in the South. People muttered that he must have been bribed by some woman. But in fact, he had received a letter from his mother the day before. <laughs> She had told him, be a good boy, Harry, and do the right thing. <laughs> Help Mrs. Cat put the rat in ratification. <laughs> and with that one vote, 22 million American women, white and black, won their equality. One vote. So I ask you this morning, do you remember your first time? Were you 18, 21, or older? Did you feel like you knew what you were doing? Were you satisfied when you were done? My very first time was very disappointing. I was 21 when I cast my first vote for president, and Ronald Reagan won. Yes. yes. <laughs> Sheila was 21, but it was a midterm election, so she says, honestly, I was more excited about being able to drink at a bar. <laughs> Flo was 21 the year the Voting Rights Act was passed. There weren't any elections that year, but she was so excited to register and remembers how proud she felt when she got her registration card in the mail. After years of segregation and racial discrimination at the polls, a student civil rights activist herself, Flo was ready to be a full participant in this democracy and to carry on the fight for justice and equality. Our personal stories reflect both our painful and pride-filled history. For black women, getting the vote has always been a matter of survival. For middle class and wealthy white women, it has always been a matter of opportunity. I know it's easy to become disillusioned with our political process today. It's tempting to do nothing but talk about the failed promise of democracy and the corrupting power of big money. But these women are still talking to us today. Prophets of the past are speaking to us through our own prophets of the present. Flo and Sheila, although they will protest as all prophets do, but I call them prophets because they are speaking to us from a place of pain, a place of compassion, and a place of deep concern. A prophet is a woman who feels fiercely. God is raging in the prophet's words. 
They know their own children and their own grandchildren are not voting and they wonder why. And I'm so glad there are young people here today because you need to vote. And so Sheila and Flo have organized and actually created an organization called VIP, Voting is Power. They have concrete and tangible goals. I'm just going to share a few, but they'll be here to talk with you afterwards. We have an election, a presidential election, coming up in just 16 months, in case you didn't know, but you probably do. So first, they ask that we all register and vote. So simple. Second, if you own a business, they're asking you to commit to have at least two voter registration drives in 2015 and to have four in 2016. If you have a position of authority in your company, they're asking you to learn about the law and to know, for example, that your employees have the right to take time off work to go and vote. Flo will be quick to remind you that Tulsa ranks 45th to 50th in everything that's good, education, energy, health, etc., and first to fifth in everything that's bad, incarceration rates, human trafficking, public transportation, etc. This won't change unless we demand that it does. Change takes time. Even in 2015, minds must be persuaded, laws must be changed, and then hearts must be converted and transformed before our daily lives will change. Flo and Sheila are ready to talk to you about a commission on de de redistricting and more. Just like the women and men before us, we will disagree. We will make mistakes. We will hurt each other in the process. We will be divided and reunited and divided and reunited again. But no matter what, everyone in this room who can has to vote. Too much has been sacrificed already to stop now. And the wrong flags are still flying. And the world and our black churches are still burning. Amen. Thanks for tuning in online. We are so pleased with all the different people who have been tuning in from all over the country and all over the world to our ministry and what we're doing at All Souls here in Tulsa. If you have a chance to send me an email or connect with me in some way, let me know what you're finding, why you tune in, and what you're getting out of it. I would love to hear from you. I'm always pleased when I get messages from different people who tell me all kinds of things about the impact of All Souls, Tulsa's ministry on them and their lives and their families. And if you get a chance to make a gift to support this ministry, to become a partner, we would love to partner with you and have you be a friend of the church and somebody who is actually supporting us to create this congregation and the world that we're trying to create together. You can be a part of it, and every gift of every amount makes a difference. We really appreciate your support.